Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And you're very welcome along to Friday Night Racing or Friday Afternoon Racing if you're on the early showing. And uh, our matinee is, of course, every three o'clock on Friday afternoons. We broadcast this live on OTB Sports Radio, on YouTube, on Facebook and on Twitter as well. And then, of course, Friday nights at eight o'clock. We are a staple now at... uh, uh, Friday night racing, eight o'clock. Friday night racing, eight o'clock. On news talk, on off the ball. Johnny, how are you? Friday night racing, eight o'clock. This yeah. is you made this look too easy, Johnny. That, yeah. was, that was it. I'm freaked out now by your presence, a in studio and the fact that we're doing it together. Yeah, I think um, I think the people who performed in your stead did better than you normally do, to be honest. Good. Including me. Good. That will raise all our standards. You're also a boss of mine, so probably shouldn't. Have Nothing said. like a bit of competition. Yeah. No, it was good. Stepped in and racing people are open to. Um, Outside is coming in, and they don't. Even if you're interviewed by somebody who's not necessarily into racing or, or that, like I think racing people are very fair. Like they'll they'll answer in a manner that's if they're on say racing TV or if they're in the specialist newspaper, they'll be a bit different if they're talking to someone like us because we are trying to sell the sport as well to people who are not necessarily into racing. And I guess one of the challenges there is a lot of jargon. Like if you go into if you look at a race meeting, there's a lot of jargon, and you're, you're you know there's weights, there's claimers, there's blah 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 handicaps, there's stakes races. A lot of stuff people don't uh, understand, and we are trying to sell the sport. I We're suppose. trying to explain the glossary as we go, yeah. uh, while while we telling people stories. So if anybody wants to share any stories with us, you can leave a comment for us in the YouTube stream or you can text the show this evening on 53106 and uh, there's plenty for us to get stuck into. Uh, we'll talk about the IHRB and that kind of stuff a little bit later on. But first I want to bring our guest in at this point. Valerie Keatley is with us. Valerie, good afternoon to you. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. It's been a big week for you. Um, it's, a, it's, it's difficult sometimes for the industry to recognise people who aren't winning the trainer's title or winning big races but this week was a big opportunity for the entire industry to come together and celebrate and uh, you ended up a winner so congratulations thank you very much thank you what was it like yeah it was a great it was a great week it was a brilliant week to be honest to actually be recognized and to win my my bit of then and then come along and win the overall it was just unbelievable i can't describe it it was just great so you won the Leadership Stable Award and then the overall award is the Irish Racing Excellence Award at the Godolphin Stud and Stable Staff Awards on Wednesday and that, that's the top award of the show. One of the things that, we, as Johnny's just said, we're trying to explain the glossary and, and how the actual industry works and the different roles that there are available to people. What do you do for Johnny Marta in that yard? What, what does the title Head Girl actually entail? It entails a lot of things. You have to make sure everything is running smoothly. Uh, care of the horses, the staff, every li- literally overseeing everything. To be honest, because Johnny is so busy in and out of the gallops that he doesn't get to see everything. So if there's any little thing that I see, I pass it on to him, and he deals with it then. It's so, kind of like a, in other sports, director of football or director of rugby, and the head coach. You got to let the head coach free to be creative and do all that stuff, but you need an incredible team who are there to make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be and that everybody is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, look, we have a great team in the yard. Everyone works really, really hard. We all go in in the morning. There are lots, Johnny has the lots all down on the board and everyone knows what horse to, to go to. If they see a little issue or a little problem, they'll give me a shout, I'll go check it out and uh, leg them up. Then they go out and they walk around for 15, 20 minutes and they head out the gallops and I'd go and I'd put horses on the walker. We've vibrating floor, horses go on that. So you're literally going the whole time. Do you know what I mean? It's quite busy yard. It's quite an active yard at the moment. It's not a job for egos really, Valerie, is it? Because like when you think about it, um, you know, Jerry mentioned director of football, but the, the head girl and generally it's the head lad obviously as well, which we can talk about later, but like <laughs> apart from sort of the racing circle, people don't really know these people yet. The amount of work you have to do behind the scenes is almost up there with the trainer. Yeah, it is. It's look, it's very, very hands on. You have to you you have to know your job, to be honest. You have to have eyes to see every little detail. A horse might be passing you by and you say, Whoa, whoa it's a bit of a leg or something that could be swelling anywhere in mm. its leg that it injured in the stable. So you have to have your eyes open to what's going on around you. 
Do you know what I mean? That you can see these things. So it's quite important like that. I suppose what what makes it so challenging for you is that your boss is so unenthusiastic and kind of boring day to day as well. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I tell you, if you can keep up with him, you're going well because he's as fast as the horses the way he goes around. It is mad, Jerry. He's very... He's very active, and I think because he's so positive and active, I think you get in that role, and you know what I mean. You keep going. Do you know, you never get tired. You just go keep going the whole time. To be honest, it's it's very very active yard. We're quite busy at the moment, but we're getting results. Things are going quite well. So I was going to talk about good. the I was going to talk about the results. Before we do that, I want to play this video because this is the the clip of the actual moment where you pick up. Uh, it's, this is the second one, not the Leadership <laughs> Stable Award. This is the overall Irish Racing Excellence Award. Have a look. We had a great, um, great time in Royal Ascot. Bar- Valerie's part of the team, but uh, it just keeps getting better. Congratulations, Valerie. You're the overall winner oh of the racing, racing Godolphin Stud and Stable Staff Excellence Award. Congratulations. Well deserved. It. Oh. I know. Oh, <laughs> Well done. well done, Valerie. It's an absolute honour to crown you the 2021 Irish Racing Excellence Award winner. I hope you can, you can gather your emotions together for a moment <laughs> to tell us, tell us what it means to you. <laughs> oh, God, this week has just been brilliant between Alcott and now this, and hopefully we can crown it with the Derby. <laughs> 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 oh, it's special. Thank you very, very much. Oh, I can't believe that. Oh, I really can't. So well Thank done. Look, we could see in your initial video how much it meant to you and how much working with horses clearly meant to you. So congratu- congratulations and massive well done to you and to the team there. Well done. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God, that's special. Thank you very, very much. Totes of most, Valerie. It obviously means a lot to Johnny as well and to the yard and to the people who work there. It does. As I say, we have a really, really good team there at the moment. Everyone pulls together. And look, it all comes down from Johnny and Orla. They're very positive about what they do. They know, they really zoom in. Like Johnny, every horse is good to Johnny. Every horse is good. But he's good or not, he, they're good. And he means to get that out of them all. And I think that's driven across to all the staff as well. Do you know, they're positive in the place. And I think that really, really shows. So it does. We 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 had um, I, I can't remember exactly what it was. There was some sort of a, maybe an Irish Champions Weekend preview or something or other. Anyway, but I, I remember Johnny Murta was was one of the kind of guests. This is going back a few years now, and he just sort of started training Valerie. And um, I was talking to Fran Berry about this recently. He said Johnny always believes in his own ability. And at that time, he was saying that um, he. I was saying like, what What have you picked up in terms of training and all that? From he said, well, I do the way things were done in Bally Doyle, give or take. You know, that's I. I, I picked mm. up a lot there. But then he said, um, I. Yeah, I, I said, how much do you charge? Like, because you know, it's 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 important. <laughs> he said six sixty quid a day. So I said, well, give 60 quid a day, that's give or take two grand a month to have a horse with you, and you're not really proven as a trainer. And he said, yeah, 60 quid a day. Um, I won't be cutting corners. Um, I believe in that you need to you know, pay, you need to do the best. Um, you need to be do the best by the horses. And I remember coming out that night, this is either going to go one or two ways, because like 60 quid a day is expensive for a trainer starting out, albeit at the Curra. And look at him now. Yeah, he's gone to the top, but he's just... He's a really, really good trainer. But he puts the work in. Like, he feeds in the morning, he feeds in the evening, unless something else is wrong. And he's amazing. He sees little things and he'll say to me, can you check this? Can you check that? So he, He's unreal what he sees. He's, he's exceptional what he does. He really, really is. In a way, it doesn't make that much sense that he would be such a talented... Uh, jockey and then could also transfer that skill into something which is actually completely different. I know it's super related and the ability to understand when to push a horse, when not to push a horse, how well the horse was feeling in the middle of the race, at the start of the race and all that kind of stuff. It seems like instinctively uh, you should be able to transfer to training but it hasn't happened for loads of jockeys who were brilliant jockeys who then go and try and become trainers and loads of brilliant trainers were mediocre enough jockeys and what is it about him that you think has allowed him to be successful so quickly? 
I think he's positivity. He just, he can't see himself do wrong. He's right. And it does, it comes true. Everything runs smoothly. Everything goes well. And as I said to you, he sees every horse as being good. And they are. 99% of them are good. And he gets that out of them. They're all fit and well. They're athletes. They're, you know, they're there to do a job. And that's what he sees. And it comes out of them. So it does. What's your own background, Valerie? How did you get into racing in the first place? Uh, I grew up with ponies. Um, I went, left school, sorry, at 15, but got a job straight away. And I worked myself up that I was in a racing yard. Uh, I started working in a stud then for my own peace of mind, how to do legs, farriers, vets. And I seen all that. I'd done about five or six years of that. And then went back to the race and then again and that's what I've been doing. I've been with Johnny since he sort of started and it's been a brilliant place. He's had loads and loads of success. I've been with him with the good horses, so it's it's brilliant, so it is. When you left school, did you know that you were going straight into racing? Was it always the thing that, like, from the time you were 10 or 11 and with the ponies, you were like, I'm going to work in racing? Yes, I love animals. I love horses. They're, they're like a drug. They're brilliant animals. I think if you... If you're around them a good bit, you get to know them all. They've all different characters, but they're they're absolutely beautiful animals. So they are, they're beautiful animals. I, I look, I love them. They're like a drug to me. I, as I say, I'm not worried about money. It's the horse. And that's me. I just love them as an animal. And were you I from love working were, with them? Were, were you from a racing family, or what was the? How did the ponies come to be? Nothing. I, my mother was actually terrified of Lord Mercy. Lord, she, if she asked me to do something, I'd bring the pony into the kitchen so I didn't have to do it. She'd be gone running up the stairs. So my mother was terrified of ponies. My dad would have liked animals, all right. He would have like, he would have taken in a few horses in on the land and stuff. He would have been a small farmer. But um, no, that's how I just I grew to love them. My next door neighbor would have had horses, so that's how I got involved with them. I don't, I don't think as well now, maybe I'm wrong in this, I don't think you have to have any background in racing or horses whatsoever to fall in love with horses. And, like, I've made this point a few times, Valerie. If you, if you brought 100 kids, we'll say, like, say, back in the day, I would have gone to the Gaeltuck for three weeks or whatever and you tried to learn Irish. But 100 kids from randomly around Ireland, north and south, brought them to various training yards, spent three weeks with horses. Like, how many of them would have fallen in love with horses? That's what I'm saying. They're they're the type of animal they're very easy to fall in love with. Do you know what I mean? And I, as I say, ninety percent of them you do get a reward out with them, and you don't. There's a couple of kids in our place that haven't have no horsey background, and they've went into race and have come forward and have do you know what I mean? Worked themselves up, and are in Johnny's now at the moment. So do you know what I mean? And he's great for those type of kids. Do you know what I mean? He helps them shows them what to do and then there's a couple of jockeys there as well that helps them so no, as you say you don't have to have a horsey background to get into them Was it a controversial decision to leave school at 15 to go and work with horses? No I wasn't very brainy and I just said mother here it is I'm out here <laughs> And that was it? I left them right. and that was it <laughs> There was no discussion? Yeah none whatsoever <laughs> none whatsoever it was very easy How quickly did you yeah. get did you get the job after that? No, I literally started at 15. I'd left school and I got a summer job straight away and that was it. Right, so you weren't going back? Into a race and yeah. No, I wasn't going back. I'm getting money. I don't care. I'll work myself up and that's what I did. I think if you work hard, you'll work yourself up to something. It's a, it like Obviously, you have something a bit special as well to be put in charge of a yard the size of, of Johnny Mertis. So there's probably a, a bit of your story here where you're skipping kind of something, some penny drops, some some yeah. deep understanding that you've you've reached of how the game should work and how it should run. I, well, I've done a good bit of pre-training and I'm breaking horses. And I trained a few my game and I had a little bit of success and a lot of horses ran well for me. So it was more or less from that. It was with the recession at the time, I had small, small owners and I was being left with big bills. And I remember ringing Johnny looking for a job and he said, look, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. And he rang me and the rest is history. I got the job with him. That was when, when thank he, God I did. When he was just starting up. So like, I'm just trying to work out the time frame here. 
when did when were you training and breaking horses? Uh, for about seven or eight years before I went to Johnny's. Right. I was breaking and pre-training and then all that type of thing. So with a combination of what I had done down through the years, I had, you know what I mean? I had built up to what I was able to do and which you have to be confident in what you do then as well. Do you know what I mean? You have to know what you do. I think after looking at in, working in studs, then into racing yards, it's what you push yourself. You'll get to learn different things. Like there's people working in racing yards and they're just in it for the sake of it. But I pushed myself. I went through the studs. I went to racing yards and I got to watch and see all these things being done. So you're soaking so, up information from different yards about how they, how they do different... Yeah, yeah, how it's done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just brought, as I say, I brought forward, as I say, it was easier then to ask Johnny for a job like I did because I'd sort of pre-trained and broken, uh, trained a few horses on my own that I sort of knew and I was quite confident in what I'd done. Right. And did you enjoy being a trainer? It, was it simply a question of at that time it would be impossible to maintain that as a career because of the recession? Exactly. I had a few horses for myself and... Uh, those friends and stuff that I had horses, I had five or six winners, a good few horses were placed. But as I say, the recession and I wasn't, I was losing money. So I had to get out of it. It just, it wasn't possible to stay doing what I was doing. And is that a bit heartbreaking at that stage where you've left school at 15 and, and pulled yourself up by the bootstraps, gone around, learned as much as you possibly can, soaked up all the information and you started to have some success and all of a sudden the arse falls out of the, the economy? Yeah, it is hard, but I think the way things were going and it was getting harder and harder for me to get money in. I think after getting my first or second week's wages, I went, oh, this is the life now, thank God. <laughs> it was so much easier then, do you know what I mean? Yeah. We actually get wages because when you're working for yourself, there'll be weeks, you're 24-7 and there's some weeks you didn't get money in. So you had to be careful with what you spent, what was going out and what was coming in. So as I say, when I finished and started working with Johnny to actually get my first two or three weeks wages was just brilliant. I said, yeah, this is so much easier. And I've no doubt as well that the fact that you had managed to be successful on, on that scale gives whoever hires you great confidence that you're not just competent, but you know exactly what you're doing. And there's a real talent there that they can work with as well. Yeah, exactly. And as I say, I think I've brought everything forward. As I say, Johnny look he knows everything he sees everything but I think I brought a little bit of my knowledge too to him as well and we work well together we're a good team I think anyway and as I say with him nominating me it just shows the belief he has in me too to you know that we're a good team yeah of course and so, like I maybe I was wrong in characterizing it as like the separation of of the roles being very distinct the head coach and the director of rugby or football whatever it sounds like you actually everybody does a little bit of everything as well and that there will be times when you know you have the responsibility for whatever whatever program of training they're doing that day yeah exactly if johnny's not there with the covid at the moment it's hard um as i say he's around 90 percent of the time but if he wasn't there i it's totally left in my hands to keep an eye and go out and check things go out to the gallops with the horses and stuff and make sure everything, like he would touch base every evening and what it'd be. That's very rare that happens because Johnny is very, very hands-on. I think he likes being in the yard. He likes to do things himself, yeah. which is good. You know what I mean? It takes a little bit of pressure off us. But uh, look, if we see things, we have to answer back to him. But Well, that, that keeps standards high when everybody's involved in it as well. Our guest this week is Valerie Keatley. You're listening to Friday Night Racing, brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. This is Off the Ball on News Talk. You can get us, of course, on the OTP Sports app as well. It's free as well. Uh, you can download that in the App Store or uh, on Google Play. Valerie, you talked about how busy it was and in the video that we showed. You were talking about um, being at Ascot as well. So the success is obviously something that keeps everybody really buzzed and energetic and enthusiastic about things as well. And you're having a fair bit of it at the moment. So um, maybe talk to us about some of the, the actual horses in the yard. What was the, what was the situation like at, uh, at Ascot when you were over there? It was absolutely electric. As I say, I made a show of myself again, crying when Matt Chapman came over to interview us. But to have, I don't think people realise 
what it's like to actually have a winner there on the day. Like, we're every day working with these horses. We see them the whole time. And to actually walk that horse into the parade ring after winning is something special. I've been lucky enough to do it twice. I done it with Royal Diamond when Johnny was still riding and with great belief, as I say, last week. So it's special. That means everything to the staff. It, it means a lot to bring the likes of those horses in. Do you know what I mean? It's super. It's absolutely super. We, we spoke about Ben Cohen last week, actually, with Gavin Ryan. Um, he was a little bit more nuanced, I'd say, in his celebration than you were. <laughs> yeah, Ben said to me after, he said, God, I felt like crying. I said, why didn't you let it out? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it, Dead right. It, <laughs> yeah, it, look, it means a lot to us. And I think that really shows what we think of our job, what we think of the horses. Do you know what I mean? They're our priority. We wouldn't let anything happen to them. Do you know they mean everything to us. He, they mean everything to us. He was interviewed after you, the two-year-old winner um, in Tipperary there the other night. Um, and, you know, he, he's a kind of a, I guess he's like a softly enough spoken fella, but I, I'm just thinking, you know, it's hard to get an ego in racing yards because it, it, maybe there's so much of a team there. Like, this, you're, you're probably brought back down, back down to Earthswell, but everyone is riding out and everyone's working together for the same goal, which is essentially a winner for the trainer. Exactly. Look, Ben is very level-headed. He doesn't, well, he doesn't show it that he gets over, over excited. But he's very, very, very professional at his job. And he's a really, really good rider. He's a really good rider, so he is. Question in from Patrick watching on YouTube. I always notice the horses in the parade ring who have fancy checkerboard designs on their coats. Who does that? Is there a horse groomer? Look, we all, when we lead up horses, there's quarter markers that we have and we put quarter marks on the hind quarters. Um, look, there's different types of stencils that we have, that we use. Is that, the, is that and, a brush? Is that uh, how that happens? No, it's a sort of a a piece, a piece of plastic and you just brought, brush the hair the opposite way to it. Right. And it just puts designs on their hind quarters. It looks fancy. It looks like it takes for ages, but it sounds like it's like whip, whip. And that's it. It's done, is it? Exactly. Right. It is. Once the horse, once the horse is a keen, it takes nothing just to do what you're doing. I thought it was kind of a bearded hipster barber who was there shaving the thing on twenty-eight quid. <laughs> yeah, forty-five probably these days. <laughs> obviously not the case. No, no, no. It's not. As I said, there's stencils that we use on each horse, and we just brush the hair the opposite way, and we just do zigzags, and they're done, and the horses look all. Brilliant, especially in this weather, it's quite easy to do anyway. So, what else is um, is in the yard at the moment that you're very excited about? That maybe we know a little bit less than the the than you guys do, obviously. <laughs> uh, look, a lot of the older horses are going quite well at the moment. Thank God, they're all winning or be there thereabouts. A lot of the two year olds haven't probably ran yet, and they're a lot of big big horses. So, as I say, hopefully we'll have a good back end year with them. But that, that's consistent with what he said. Uh, we had him on a podcast lately, and he was saying this. I don't know. He, he's kind of half gone off the idea of getting the sharper two-year-olds because of the ceiling that you, <laughs> you know, you reach. So uh, I then I said to him, "Law, well, so it's like it's great to think. Well, this horse could come into his own his his, his own as a four-year-old." To which he replied, "That's great, but try telling an owner. Listen, it's grand. It's two grand a month, but he'll come good in about two years' time. So I guess you have to balance it as well. Like you have to run them. You have to run them, and there, look, there probably is a lot of pressure on trainers to run these type of horses. But then, look, we're lucky that we have a couple of big, big owners, and they know that there is horses that do need time, and. As I say, no one has stopped from coming into our yard. All the owners come in and out of the yard and they see what the horses are like. And as I say, Johnny talks to them and tells them each horse individually different what they're up to doing and what they're capable of doing and what needs time and what doesn't. So it's it's quite easy to do it that way. Do you know what I mean? That they know where to stand with their horses. And it's probably nice to be called a girl again in terms of the head girl. And uh, I always laugh when Aidan O'Brien talks about the lads. Like, the lads are essentially all well into their pension age, whatever the lads. And I'm not <laughs> suggesting you're anything like that, but uh, that's a roundabout way of asking you. How many head girls are there versus head lads across the Irish, whatever there is, 300 trainers? Uh, there's very few head girls that I know of anyway. I don't think there's that many, to be honest. No, I don't think there's that many head girls. 
Yeah, I it, couldn't name them off, but I don't think mm, there's that many head girls. Yet yeah, there's, you know, it's basically 50-50 in terms of the gender split for people working within the industry itself, which, again, is something I don't think we sell enough. Exactly. I'll, I, I, I thought at the beginning of the COVID, things, this is really going to get a knock in, but I think things have picked up quite well. And I think, I don't know, to me, it feels that there's a lot more owners coming in to it. Do you know what I mean? They're inquisitive. They're trying to get into it and things. And I think there's a lot more advertisement out there to get owners into, to get more people in as owners. Do you know what mm. I mean? There's a lot more syndicates up and running and things. So... Oh, yeah, no, I think there's a good few. I think there's a good few people out there getting involved in horses. And in in so. terms of a career pathway for the young women who are trying to get into the sport, uh, it's obviously important to have jockeys. It's important to have trainers. It's important to have as high profile as you can be backroom staff as well. You have to have the backroom staff. They're the people that are at home in the yard. They're getting it going, keeping it going and getting these horses out on the day. As I say to any young person that are in our yards, work hard, push yourself, do as much as you possibly can. And I'm not saying they'll all make it because they can't, but if you push yourself hard enough and work hard, you have a chance of getting to the top. Well, you're work right. Hard. You're right there. Congratulations on the award this week. It, it sounds like it's completely well-deserved. Thanks a million for your time today, Valerie, and continued success. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've been a, sh a shade disappointed now on the whole emotional stakes. I mean, <laughs> coming on off the ball was kind of like brushing your teeth compared to the other two days. Oh, God, thanks. I made a show of myself. I'm sorry, but ah, look, <laughs> it meant it, to work all your life at horses, actually nominated, people realised what it meant to me. Mm. It meant everything. It's just... It's so nice to be appreciated the way it was, and I can't thank Johnny and Orla enough for it. Do you know what I mean? It means everything. It means everything. And look, Godolphin to actually stay a sponsor in it, it's, it's super that that's still going ahead. You know, it's great. It's absolutely great. So it is. Good stuff, so, Barry. I have a lot to thank them for. Well done. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thank you. No problem. It's, bye bye. It is Barry a good point because um, the, that actually is a good, good knees up. That stable yeah. staff awards night. It is like it's, um, I was invited a couple of times. You're, maybe Barbara White would sort of plan the tables like you would plan a wedding, you know, like, well, would he go well with her? Is that a singles table? Bit of an age kind of balance at that table. All right. You end up just being at a tell table. Us, tell us about the gossip from the, go on, you're, have you, that like, I mean, maybe you don't want to tell us this gossip no, on live. See, no, well, you're going to end up in a bit if, trouble? If you put, if you, no, if you put racing people, uh, you know, at a function and they've, they've a few beers, like they, they, because they're so lively and vivacious, they can't but, like, it's just a great night out. But I, I was at a table with Paul Nolan and his his gang, like, and Paul and James Nolan talking hurling, and Tommy Woods was, I think he won an award that night. Tommy's in his 80s now, and he was a bit like Valerie, very emotional. And I, you shouldn't underestimate how much this means. No, absolutely, I know it means, you can see it. It might mean nothing to people who are not in racing, but, uh, you know, her emotion wasn't... I mean, the Stephen Kenny interview last night... You know, a bit of emotion is a good thing at times, isn't it? One hundred percent, absolutely. Because uh, what's the point in keeping it in? We're all going to be dead at some point. Mm. Uh, Friday night racing and off the ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie or follow the Twitter account at hri racing, and the hashtag is every racing moment. The racing this weekend, uh, we should talk about the Carl. Carl Eclipse tomorrow. Yeah, the racing in Ireland, Bellu Sounds Festival ends um, on ends tomorrow, um, which has been a three-day festival. Again, you know, Bellu Sound is very much about the people. Um, apparently, racing goes back like to the mid-eighteenth century in Bellu Sound. I think there's stories of Napper Tandy and a few characters who might have had horses there. But um, do you know? We actually we we should have talked about this week. Was, yeah. The art collection of Barney Eastwood is on sale this week and there's loads of racing pictures, including some Jack B. Yates. His art collection is probably going to end up being worth about 100, 150 million. Mm. He had loads of Lucian Freud because he was the bookie. Himself and his partner were Lucian Freud's bookie. Lucian Freud was apparently a degenerate gambler who like couldn't pay his debts and so would whip out some paintings and give it to the lads. Yeah. And the lads built up this massive collection of paintings. And now, um, so the young minor footballer from Tyrone ended up with one of the great Irish... And there's loads of sports. There's a Jack B. Yates painting of um, Kerry versus Dublin, the the mascot, it's called. And it's going to go for 250 grand or something, or 340 And on today's show, our special prize is, yeah, like... Some Lucy and Freud, because he couldn't pay his gambling <laughs> yeah. debts. 
it well yeah like if if you know it's, it's you've seen that down the years but that that's I didn't I didn't uh, I omitted to mention that yeah a bit of Jack B Yates in the show uh, the, so it was the mention of Value Sign races there's I think I don't know there's definitely some ancient Irish racing photograph or paintings that were done that were part of the collection because mm. I was looking at it. If you're in the stand in Bellystown on a relatively clear day because it's up on a hill, apparently if you're into your cycling there's some great climbs around Bellystown because it is, it's the hill of Crockerfoot I think it's called, but you can see the slither of coastline that Mead kind of has. Yeah. So like it's, it's, it's beautiful. I think you can see the Betty's over town. to Cooley and so forth and all that. Um, yeah, it's so, like, obviously, I've gone on about this a long time. It is disappointing that people aren't there. Um, and there's talk that maybe Galway might potentially get a few few thousand people in. But um, the, the eclipse tomorrow, um, Mishri, Feldrama, St. Mark's Basilica and Adeb. It's a brilliant race for four runners. Um, and then we've Value Sound on, uh, we've also Naced. And then on Sunday, it's uh, Tremor and Limerick. Yeah, so good racing over the weekend. Okay. The other thing, the, um, when you're saying the IHRB, you're going to have a new leader at some point soon? Yeah, this was, uh, I, you know, racing exists in a bubble, might be the kind of term for a lot of things in Cobble, but racing does exist in a bubble. But um, Dennis Egan's decision to take early retirement. Um, as the IHRB chief executive was announced, I think yesterday, um, and there's only been kind of limited enough reaction to it uh, because obviously it's in, in its infancy. But the timing cannot but spark conversation because obviously the um, Rocks Committee have the IHRB, the Trainers Association, and the and HRI, I think, um, in next week to talk about basically the fallout from Jim Bulger's allegations. Um, Jim Bulger is not attending, um, but Dennis Egan is actually, which which kind of, you know, would suggest that, well, th there's no timing relevance here, but I don't know. I mean, it just seems a bit strange that he's, he's taken early retirement. He said it was he, the decision I have taken was in line with the condition of an early retirement scheme and has been something I gave deep thought to. Um, he's 26 years at Turf Club and IHRB. It's a long time. It is, know? yeah. Um, like, I, I, I don't know, I think that... Um I think COVID made a lot of people think about a lot of things. And mm -hmm. if you have the opportunity to avail of a package, uh, then I think fresh blood in an organisation like that is no harm. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's 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 a strangely anachronistic kind of private members body that's kind of publicly funded. Um, so it has a lot of contradictions, and I haven't I literally haven't a breeze who could get that job. I have no idea if if. If Paddy Power are going to have betting on it, um, I've, I'd say it would take them a long time to come up with odds. But um, I, uh, you know, Richie Forrest has an interesting article in the Racing Post about it. I think the the IHRB and the Turf Club that preceded this, maybe in recent years, there have been far too many controversies for 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 the liking of the sport, which is is obviously bad in one level. But at least it's suggesting that things have been done in terms of you know any any drug related issues. Um, one thing I would say about Dennis Egan was I thought he was brilliant to deal with personally um, I think his recent TV performances he'd TV performance with Gary O'Brien and a TV performance with RT this year which basically betrayed the fact that um, the IHRB had appointed a spokesperson in the last year or two and he wasn't dealing with the media anymore and I thought he suffered I thought he was quite poor um, in terms of his problems particularly with Hugh Cahill on RT which was around the Viking Horde case I think but having, having said all of that um, some that I think should be mentioned I had gotten um, word of, 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 a, of a jockey who was going to be done for having tested positive for um, cocaine a, a few years ago and Dennis Egan um, was extremely conscious of the welfare of the jockey and the, the, I remember it was if there's anything in the paper about this you got to make sure that his family know about it you know and this they cannot be reading stuff like this in the paper and um, and he was very conscious and that's been referenced i think in some of the tributes to him very very conscious of the well-being of the people that he was looking after and even if um even if a jockey erred he was always trying about the rehabilitation and like thinking of the the, the people involved so i think he deserves a lot of credit for that okay so we'll find out i presume soon enough who is going to get that gig and they will have a job to 
modernised the communication strategy at least. Yeah, it's been very poor and, it, you know, a lot, r racing kind of drags itself into the, the modern um, era, very much kicking and screaming. But, um, you know, the, the Oireachtas committee is, is, is going to be interesting because m regardless of what you think of what Jim Bulger has intimated, it's kind of been the, the thing that everyone has been talking about. And a lot of people in racing will, with, a lot of people not in racing will look at it and say, well, racing is bent and we have to, you know, we have to do something about this. So hopefully, you know, a lot of these Ross committee you know, there can be a lot of stupid questions asked. Hopefully the right questions are asked. And There's generally a lot of grandstanding. People mm. talking about uh, tickets and the great stuff and their grandfather went racing and the granny before that was a, a, a farrier and uh, the, the bell goes and that's your 10 minutes. Michael uh, Healy Ray will not be asked next week's meeting. Um, I'm pretty <laughs> confident. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of that nonsense. But you know, all, all joking aside though, the IHRB will have a tough line of questioning um, because a lot of people now will think, well, if Jim Bulger is saying it, it has to be right. Well, uh, it's really unfortunate that Jim Bulger isn't going. He's, He's never going to go. I, like, I thought that he could have gone. I thought that there was loads of ways to go and to give more information and to stop short of naming people. And we talked before about how the, the protections aren't really there for for people and um, and you know we as a country decided that we didn't want people to have protections at the at the Oireachtas hearings. I think that was a mistake that we all made. But anyway, uh, I, it's disappointing that he's not going because if you if you go out and you start talking about this, you kind of have to follow it through. It's really important, and also you need other people if if other people have information to come forward and, and speak. And I my concern would be that this would be the end of of this particular part of the story, and mm. there there the unanswered questions. They linger, and while the unanswered questions linger, you know. So look, maybe the new head of the IHRB comes in and speaks very clearly and speaks very well and sends out a message and uses all the powers available to them, and that gives people confidence because that's where the confidence comes from. It For doesn't sure, come from yeah. everybody saying, "Oh, there's nothing to see here." Do yeah, because you know? that's no, not where. No, absolutely. And um, one one kind of anomaly of all this is Jim is no longer in the Irish Racehorse Trainers Association, so. The, the Irish Race Horse Trainers Association, I don't know who's going to be, rep presumably Michael Grassick or whatever, um, he's not really bound to defend Jim Bulger in the sense that he's not a member of the organisation. So Jim is not represented in any shape or form. Right. And, uh, you know, pretty much everyone there wants Jim to be wrong. The IHRB does not want what he's saying to be right. HRI obviously doesn't. We don't want drugs in the sport. And neither do the trainers. So Jim will be, I'm sure he'll be on his laptop or hard drive or whatever watching this with um, with interest, but he may well reflect on Dennis Egan's departure and say, you know, are all these things connected? What's coming down the tracks from IHRB? Because there could be a lot. Okay. With none of us having Irish Derby winner Hurricane Lane in our stables, the tout tend to follow standings remain pretty much the same. Tom alone killing us. He's out in front on 218 points. None of our selections are set to run in Saturday's Carl Eclipse bonus race. So it seems Tom is secure in the top spot for another week. 218 he's on. I'm in second on 121 and you are Paddy last at uh, 75 points. Very embarrassing, Johnny. Dismal. At some point you'll get over it, don't worry. Mm. Uh, that is your lot this week on Friday Night Racing. As ever, you can leave a comment in the YouTube channel or, of course, you can text the show 53106. Friday Night Racing and Off the Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.